Recently, I made a video called How Magic's Greatest Asset is Being Destroyed, where I talked about how old magic cards are becoming obsolete at an increasing pace thanks to a shift in magic design philosophy. Now, in response to this video, I got some comments where people seem to think that Hasbro was the cause of these shifts. And Hasbro, if you don't know, is the company that owns Wizards of the Coast. And so there is a general sentiment in the community that Hasbro is oftentimes only motivated by profit and that they are kind of controlling Wizards of the Coast's actions and forcing them to do the most profitable thing at all times. This is not just a sentiment I've seen in response to my video. I've seen it almost any time Magic the Gathering and money come up in the same sentence. Now, one of the reasons I wanted to delve deeper into this topic is because I know that Wizards of the Coast was purchased by Hasbro in 1999, over 20 years ago. So this shift in design philosophy is coming a long time after Hasbro has owned Wizards of the Coast. So there's likely a different cause of this particular change. And so I wanted to delve deeper so we can all be a little bit more informed about the topic. Now, the general kind of consensus is that this kind of shift came about called the fire philosophy. And the first reference I could find to this philosophy of fire in an article comes from this 2019 article by Dave Humphreys. And if you don't know, Dave Humphreys was a lead designer on War of the Spark, a set that came out in 2019. However, it is generally known in the magic community that sets that come out in like 2019 were probably like released from like the hands of the designers in like a couple years before. So like in maybe 2017, where the designers need to get rid of the, get the cards designed so that the product can be created and shipped out and all of that stuff. And the key point of this article is that in month 11, so quite a bit of ways into his design, he talks about a lot of stuff in this article, but in month 11, there was a turning point for War of the Spark. Aaron Forsyth, who, in case you don't know who Aaron Forsyth is, the vice president of design of magic and former Magic the Gathering Pro. So he's pretty influential in the design process. And he's delivered an impassioned speech about things we work further on to generate excitement with our cards. He's gonna just paraphrase here, but re-examining a great many things and the refinement of our core R&D goals as fire. Fun, inviting, replayable, exciting. And a major repercussion is that they're experimenting with more and exciting powerful commons than we've done in the past. Uh, and they're just gonna be trying to make cards that are more exciting there, not just in this set, but it's gonna be a philosophy moving forward with other sets too. And then a key sentence, this discussion transcends just commons, although the delta there is perhaps the easiest to see. Some of this is a matter of more risk taking and iteration now that we have further play design resources and experience on our team, having seen their work enter the real world. So they're erring on the side of excitement over matching some of the metrics we've set up for ourselves. And that's just kind of a key piece of information. Now, the next article that references the philosophy of fire goes a little bit more in depth. It's also from 2019, and it's just talking about how they applied this design to some cards from the core set that year, core set 2020, as a way of showing that it wasn't just War of the Spark that was getting this new treatment. It was all sets going forward. So F is for fun. I is for inviting. Our game should be accessible. F, our game should be fun to play. R is for replayable. The key aspects are balance and diversity. E is for exciting. Should be excited to read cards and play with them. They can inspire cool new decks and archetypes for players to build and own. They designed commons that were more powerful. So Cloud can see one of the most powerful commons ever printed up to that point. Murder going down to common. And they just are generally increasing power level. They're making gain lands instead of just general tap lands. And then they're just kind of making like kind of, they just wanted to talk about a different design for a card that they had made. So fire is fun, inviting, replayable, exciting, all sounds like good goals, but what has happened in recent years, let's just look at the standard bands since this 20, like kind of 17 type thing. I mean, philosophy of fire was kind of coming around this time. And, uh, this is the bands the year after. So they'd already been having some band trouble. So they went from 2006 to 2016 with only two bands. Then they had this kind of while where they were kind of on rocky ground already. And then 2019 comes along and in 2019 they banned five cards, which was very high. And then 2020 when the philosophy really kicked in was when we started to see some truly broken cards. And the reason I'm going to a different like PowerPoint slide here thing is because I didn't want to block off the image with my head. So 
yeah, that's why we're going here for just this one. But yeah, massive spike in banned cards. So they are pushing the envelope. That's what fire is. Fire is pushing the envelope pretty much in their designs. And let's see. MTG Arena release year beta 2017. And if we go by the two years of pre-design, so if they release the set or whatever, um, two years later, Magic the, Magic the Gathering <laughs> Arena is coming out in 2017. And this was the first set that they maybe could have designed once they knew Magic Arena was going to be a thing. That's kind of where, this is kind of the pattern that I'm seeing here. I'm seeing, okay, this comes out in 2019. What happened two years before when the set was being designed? Magic Arena was coming out. They wanted to push Magic Arena potentially. This is, this is could be just a coincidence, could be. But Magic Arena was coming out in 2017. Um, MTG Arena was first mentioned in August of 2017. And uh, November 2017 was when like the, the beta stuff started. So they're kind of getting, getting everything kind of geared up for this 2019 when they're going to have all of these powerful cards coming and generating a lot of excitement. Um, and so maybe MTG Arena was the reason for the philosophy of fire. Now, I looked for other things that happened in around that time period, and a new CEO came to Wizards of the Coast in 2016. So 2016, he has a year to work on stuff before he comes up with MTG Arena in 2017. And that's when the designers kind of get this, oh, let's uh, have our impassioned speech that we have where they talk about how we need to make things more exciting, generate more excitement for our cards. It's all kind of lining up here. And the key figure in all of this is the Magic the Gathering CEO, Chris Cox. He uh, came there in 2016. He came to WotC from Microsoft. So he wasn't just coming from another like game design company. He was coming from a tech company. He'd been there for a while. We can look into uh, the former CEO of Voices of the Coast who had been with Hasbro for a long time building toys. He headed up Hasbro's boys group. That's their, I did a little bit of looking in. That's the uh, group that makes toys for boys, as they say. And uh, yeah, he had been working there for quite, for a little bit of time. Chris Cox comes in and he had come from uh, a, a Microsoft background. He had worked technical sales at Microsoft, uh, global sales technical, so more electronics. He worked as vice president of educational games at LeapFrog uh, for any folks who had those things. Um, and uh, that was like an educational software type thing. So more on the digital side, marketing leadership positions in Xbox, uh, franchises like Halo. So he had worked in kind of this gaming space before. Um, we kind of have similar information here. He was $250 million learning games unit. Um, digital background is an important co component of his experience and was one of the reasons for getting hired because they wanted a new direction. So this could be maybe Wizards of the Coast thinking of this direction, or maybe they hired him and then he was like, okay, this is stuff we can do that they hadn't even previously thought of. But I would imagine the MTG Arena was in the works a little bit before this, uh, before he got hired and maybe they brought him on as CEO so he could facilitate this process potentially. So uh, he incorporated both the digital R&D team, Magic Online team into the digital game studio. And uh, yeah, he's done a lot of work. If you look at his LinkedIn page, um, you can see he had a lot of years at Microsoft and uh, he's got like group product manager, Xbox games for three years, MSN, um, go to market planning. Yeah, but online marketing, trading, so all this stuff, um, technical sales. And then he goes to Wizard of the Coast and now he is the president of Hasbro. So that's a little bit about Chris Cox and he's just kind of living the dream here. He, he played Magic the Gathering in the past. He's coming to Wizards of the Coast. And uh, he's kind of trying to make the, the game kind of grow and things of that nature. Uh, if we look at this article where it's talking to him in 2018. So he's been there for a couple years at this point. Because remember, he got hired in 2016. So he's been there a couple years at this point. And uh, he's talking about how um, the key thing I took away from this article was that Magic is seeing a lot of growth um, and that there was a line in here that I was looking for. Where is it? He talks about a hockey stick growth pattern. Yeah, the tabletop side is obviously where the majority of our business is, is today and we will still see a, a big robust future for that. The digital side is kind of where the disconnect comes between the straight line growth curve and the hockey stick. So if straight line growth is like this, a hockey stick growth is like this, where you see a massive exponent. At least that's where it goes in my mind, because I feel like they wouldn't name it that if it wasn't like that. It's got, like that's just the logical uh, explanation for that. A fair amount of time, my time is spent on new initiatives and helping to build those teams and groom our plans for that. So 
it looks like they brought in the CEO because they had this plan for a digital future. And uh, yeah, they're, they're just getting there. Like they're still just talking about kind of, yeah. And this is another key part of the article. We're a unique games company and half of our population works on tabletop and the other half works on new digital games. So they are getting a lot of more digital stuff. Cox said about 80% of the people they've hired have been new digital initiatives since he joined the company. They have about 600 people and they're hiring a lot more in the digital side of things. So pretty interesting stuff. He played with pen and paper through eighth grade, switched over to digital games and played those D&D games through college. So he switched over to digital games himself from playing analog games. So he kind of had that experience himself. And this is where we get some really interesting stuff because we have an interview between uh, some folks from Hipsters of the Coast and uh, Chris Cox here. And he he talks about Magic the Gathering in relation to digital. And this was a really interesting quote that I found from this article. There's actually several snippets from this article that I'm gonna be going to throughout this video. But this was one of the cool things that I found that he said. And this article was from 2018. So he's been to the company a couple of years. There have been some news about uh, MTG Arena. Uh, where are we at yet? MTG release beta was 2017. So he's talking to them about this. So people know about MTG Arena at this point. But this is what he says. He says, I'll use this term called the castles and boats because they have six different digital games. Arena is what we're focusing on now. It's probably one of the biggest and most important of these initiatives. Think about like kind of magic as a castle. The magic paper business is this big, bold business that has tons of fans, a lot of history, a lot of partnerships that are very important and the people who are super passionate about it. And so you treat magic as this castle that you want to defend and you want to take care of and you want to grow over time. If a castle costs a trillion dollars to make, a boat costs a fraction of what a castle costs. Boats don't always pan out. You can send a boat out and sail for 20 days and not find anything and it comes back empty handed. And that's okay. When we think about a lot of our new digital initiatives, we think about them as boats that kind of extend our castles of magic and D&D. I think Arena is a little different though. And I'm going to extend the metaphor maybe to his breaking point. Arena is the port that we're building on the magic castle. It's core to the castle. It represents the core of the gameplay. Doing Arena right lets us build permission with our closest and most important fans to really be able to extend the franchise in new and exciting directions. And so right now we're putting the finishing touches on that port. As we get that port in front of more fans and finalize it, you're gonna find us announcing more and more of these boats. So Arena is a huge part of his strategy. He is adding it to the Magic Castle. There is Magic the Gathering, the castle, and there is Magic the Gathering port, which is Magic Arena that is attached to that same castle. It is a key part of their strategy and it is something that is very, very important to them. He says that Magic Online is not going anywhere, at least at that point in this article and things of that. Another key thing he says, he's got um, Arena is what we're focusing on now. It's one of our most important initiatives. This is another key quote from uh, the interview. This array of digital project products are aimed at engaging people outside of the 30 to 40 million people who have already played Magic. There's probably 250 million strategy fans and probably another 250 million fans. It means about 450 to 500 million fans out there that we think our IP would be super relevant for. So they have ambitious goals. They're trying to go from 30 to 40 million to reach all 500 million of these new people. Oops, I don't want to email them. I just want to click away. That's a lot of people. The games you see us announcing and the partnerships that we announced them will make sense. They're getting a new staff. Here's another thing he said. He heavily hints that there are big announcements coming this summer. I wish you could, I could tell you more, but the interview is about six months too early. Well, six months later, when was the MPL announced? Okay, December, 2018. So maybe it was a little bit more than six months, but I feel like this is what he was referring to because this article was in February. So six months later, Kind of getting close to that December announcement of the MPL right there. Um, big stuff. I mean, he did say the summer, but it was a little bit later than that. But still, how we can further extend the reach of organized play. We have ideas to make organized play be even more watchable and streamable. Then we can get more people playing at the highest levels, taking some cues from some of the best in the business in terms of how we're thinking about the leagues and teams and kind of overall professional level play. So kind of big deal. That's This is kind of the build up port onto the castle, get that uh, new viewer experience, all that stuff. It does also coincide with the uh, long-term, oh gosh, 
I already have that article up on a different tab. The longtime head of organized play unexpectedly leaving Wizards of the Coast. They left Wizards of the Coast in, what you guessed it, 2017, a year before the MPL was announced. So they maybe maybe saw the direction it was going, didn't really, weren't on board with it. Other things got in the way maybe, but regardless, they, were, they have a new person in charge of the organized play system and we got the MPL. So kind of an interesting thing that we see there. Um, yeah, kind of interesting. Um, MPL announced 2018. He, uh, this is from 2021. Magic has 40 million players and that Magic revenues are up 23%. This is uh, last year. This year, he got promoted to be the CEO of Hasbro as a whole company. And he was replaced by Cynthia Williams, joining from Microsoft, just like he did. Uh, another kind of technical person, it sounds like. Uh, she's coming in from the uh, general manager and vice president gaming ecosystem commercial team. So she's got some uh, experience and gaming in Microsoft is more conventional gaming, like not the tabletop gaming. It's like Xbox and stuff like that. Go the expansion of Xbox gaming, game creator growth. Uh, Miss Williams spent more than a decade at Amazon where she led the global growth. It's all about growth, 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 growth. Mr. Fields, who is the other person that was coming in as the da -da -da -da, senior vice president and general manager of digital gaming, from Kabam Games, most successful mobile gaming studios in North America, where he served as CEO over the past five years. Developed and operated numerous AAA games. And uh, yeah, they're just saying, we're welcoming to our team, we're going to do great. And then they said, uh, working together, to expand our fan base, deliver across the brand blueprint, activate our significant investments in the business to become the world's leading fantasy-inspired gaming publisher on all platforms. So going into that digital space, all about expansion. Very, very interesting. Yeah, this is just kind of the, the thoughts that I have. I mean, it all kind of stems back. It was bought in 1999, but really a key date here was when uh, Chris Cox became the CEO. That was kind of, it feels like a turning point. Uh, hiring him was obviously a big decision by Wizards of the Coast. They wanted someone that could get into this digital space. It looks like Chris Cox kind of took that ball, ran with it, added the port to the castle, and now it looks like going into the future, we're kind of in a similar place where a lot of the people that they're hiring in this upper management have esports experience or these kind of digital gaming things. Arena is a big part of this and they see it kind of as this hockey stick where it, the growth is going to be exponential. It's not just going to be a line like paper gaming or things like that. They just want to, it's all about growth with them uh, is what this big takeaway seems to be. And it doesn't seem like it's really necessarily Hasbro telling them what to do. This seems like a strategy. Maybe Hasbro like chose, I mean, Hasbro chose who to hire as the head of the company, but then those people kind of ran with it. They've been kind of running with it for a while. It feels like, so when you see a big change, it, it shouldn't really come as a surprise because they've kind of been, they, they're not trying to hide their strategy. They're kind of telling it to us the way they see it. And they're, they've kind of been telling it the, the way they see it for a while. It's not like they're lurking in the shadows, manipulating things. They're kind of saying, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to become the dominant company. We are going to be the biggest. We are going to be the best. We are going to be the dominant force in all of uh, fantasy inspired gaming publishing. Um, and it looks like they, they're doing a lot of work on that field. So that was just this kind of delve that I did, this crazy side tangent that I went on. And uh, I hope you enjoyed learning alongside me. If you did, let me know in the comments. I would love to hear from you. And I hope you did enjoy this video. Subscribe for more videos. And I'll talk to you next time.